We got our final guest before we do another tap talk coming up. Uh, Rob Cartwright, the founder of Data Quencher. Rob, how are you? Good. Good. And, and uh, all right, so we see a lot of data, um, but you're doing it a little bit differently. Tell us about Data Quencher. Okay, as, sure. I, as I open this beer from Dr. Bill Sysak, well, it's, it was you? prescribed, so I have to drink it. Follow doctor's orders. Yeah. So Data <laughs> Quencher is, uh, we're a market research firm focused 100% exclusively on the craft brewing industry. So we'll survey, this year we'll survey about 10,000 beer drinkers across the country. Okay. And we ask them about what we call the three Bs, which is the, the beers, the brands, and the business of craft brewing, just to get their viewpoint. Because, you know, we, we talk to ourselves a lot within the industry, but there's not a lot of consumer research being done. So we saw a void there and we jumped in. And, and how do you identify these craft beer drinkers? Like, where are you finding them? So what we do is we've got a, um, we contract with another company that um, actually has sample in all these different states. And what we do is we say, we want to talk to people. They have to be past 30 day beer drinkers. Okay. That's really the only criteria. Yep. And then, um, yeah, we just take them through, you know, find out where they're buying, what brands they're buying, what styles they prefer. Um, and, and what have you learned so far? Like what's, uh, What's some of the more interesting data points or some of the more interesting questions that you've asked them and uh, something that you might be able to share with our audience today? Okay, sure. So um, in our most recent wave of research, uh, we asked a question about uh, political inclinations. You know, you lean liberal or conservative. And um, we were really surprised. In fact, here in California, it was probably the biggest surprise. Uh, in California, you've got about 33% of craft drinkers identify as very conservative or somewhat conservative. Interesting. So what, what, what's funny about that one in California is in California, only about 27% of the general population identifies as conservative. Hmm. Meaning if you, you know, if you talk to 100 craft beer drinkers, you're actually more likely to find somebody kind of on the right of the uh, political spectrum than the left. Interesting. Uh, very surprising. So, so you know. what... When you when you obtain data like that, when you obtain information like that, what does a what does a brewery do with that information? How do they uh, take that uh, uh, that stat of 33 percent of um, craft beer drinkers identify as conservative, and then do something with it that that impacts the way that they operate their business? Well, on that particular data point, you know the the main thing you can do is you know maybe. Be careful at your at your anti-Trump beer because everybody <laughs> seems to have one. Because <laughs> there goes thirty-three percent of your sales. You just right? you buy, well, well, actually, it's funny because just building on that, it turns out that while thirty-three percent identify as conservative, they're much less likely to not do business with somebody because of their values. So they're not going to boycott you if you do that. Right. So it's it's kind of a you're safe to go out and make that stand still. Um, but what what we'll do that we see the brewers really gravitating towards is. Um, a lot of it, their portfolio. So, example, you know, we've worked with several that specialize in one area or another, and we're able to look at their customer base and say, yeah, you know what, your customers drink these, obviously, but you know what, here's some other styles that they're drinking a lot more than most people. You know, could you consider expanding into that area to, to try and capture more of that dollar for your own brewery? So, helping them make portfolio decisions uh, based off of, you know, what you could call sort of real-time insight from, from the drinker. Right. Right, Last 30 exactly. days, right? right? Right. Very interesting. So uh, one of the other things that I think you guys have explored is the cannabis space. Mm -hmm. um, and we've heard, you know, sort of varying opinions on how much cannabis will impact beer sales specifically, but also just alcohol sales in general. Right. Um, do you have any sort of insight on... Uh, the, the disposable income aspect of it, how much consumers are spending on cannabis versus alcohol, what their preferences are, are they substituting versus complementing? I mean, what have you learned from polling consumers that uh, use cannabis and, I guess, drink craft beer as well? Great question. And we just included that in our most recent round of research. Um, and we just, we just kind of dipped our toe in the water on this one, so we didn't go super deep. But one of the things we found is that among California beer drinkers, 
almost one in five say they're spending less on alcohol today than they were before legalization. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's now, just California. Right. Okay. Right. Now, when we pose the same question to Colorado, where it's, they've had a longer, you know, more experience with it, mm -hmm. that drops down to about 13%. So it's, there's, a, there's a pretty different, significant gap between those two states. Okay. But it's fresher here, so I think that might help explain some of why we're seeing that. Um, so you think that there is uh, maybe a, a, an impetus to try cannabis here because it's legal and the, the trend will kind of correct itself over time? I think so. That, okay. would be my, that would be my gut, but honestly, we just don't have enough data to even make that call yet. How, um, about, how about long term? Do you see cannabis being a real threat to the alcohol industry? Potentially. Because, you know, it, in... I'm sure you probably talked about it with Bart earlier. You know, it seems so far not to really be hitting it too hard. Um, but that's a, you know, that's measuring things as the status quo of today. You know, will that growth that may have been in craft, you know, two years out, the growth that would have been craft has instead gone to cannabis? Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, one of the other trends that we've obviously been paying attention to is just the growth in local brands. And... Um, I actually touched on this with Bart uh, earlier today. I mean, you know, you have the sort of 5% top line figure of mid-year growth that the right. Brewers Association put out. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you see that amongst the, uh, or within that number, there are certain size breweries that are performing better than others. Mm -hmm. And the ones that appear to be performing a little bit better are the ones that are a little bit more small, a little bit more local in nature. Um, what have you learned about local brands and the importance of local? Yeah, so, uh, you know, first a disclaimer. I really hate those signs when you go into a bar. They're like, drink local, drink local, drink local. <laughs> <laughs> drink you know local what? if it's good. But you, Exactly. Yeah. But you know what? There's a reason those signs exist. Yeah. Um, we did some analysis on regional beers. So, you know, looking at a beer at its home state versus the neighboring state. And it was really interesting because if you're in your home state, if you're the home team, your quality gets ranked higher. Hmm. You're ranking as an innovative brewer, I mean, significantly higher. You're considered more innovative, you're considered higher quality, you're considered more independent. Interesting. Uh, so there's this great kind of halo effect that you get from being the home team. Even, even if the quality isn't there, or even if... Right. It right. doesn't I mean, matter. As long as you're local, you get, that, you get the benefit of being local. Right. I mean, if you're in Washington and you're you know, selling in Washington and Oregon, you're going to sell, you can sell the exact same product. You're going to see that score go up in your home state of Washington, and it's going to drop in Oregon. Right. Even though it's the same thing. Right. Interesting. Uh, what, are, what are one or two trends that uh, we should watch out for this year? Like, like something that you're paying attention to well, for the rest of the year. I mean, it could be a style trend. It could be anything. What, what is something that uh, we should be paying attention to trend-wise? Well, one that I'm really curious to keep an eye on is um, IPAs and pale ales. You, you've heard of them, right? They're, they're kind of a big thing. And <laughs> never but, have. But never have. Yeah. You should try one. They've, they've got them here yeah. all over the place. <laughs> no, uh, we did an analysis this summer when uh, the Brewer Association came out with their list of you know, the production numbers of who was growing and who was shrinking. We said, you know, I wonder if customers of growing breweries are different than customers of flat or declining breweries huh. when it comes to production. And it turns out they actually are different. Um, and one of the differences is if you're a customer of a brewery that's growing, you're actually significantly less likely to buy IPAs and pale ales compared to the average craft drinker. You're still buying a lot of them. Interesting. That doesn't mean they've, you know, given up that category. That's not it at all. But they are dramatically lower compared to everybody else. So seeing how that trend kind of plays out here, you know, we're going to be doing another big wave in December and seeing what that data looks like will be really interesting to see. So if you're a customer of a growing brewery, right. you're less likely to purchase IPAs and pale ales in general? Yes. Or from that brewery? No, in general. In general. Now, why do you think that is? Well, I think some of it might be just the kind of that pendulum swing, you know, that we've been talking about for a couple of years and certainly seeing it now. And, you know, our data shows that, that these customers are more likely to be buying lagers. They're more likely to be buying wheat beers. Um, you know, so kind of that swing back to more traditional 
you know, valid taste maybe. Um, Interesting. So would you classify those consumers then as like a more mainstream consumer that uh, potentially has come from the sort of domestic world or, or what, what type of consumer are they? That's a great question. I don't really know. I'm not sure if it's people that have kind of gone all the way out and now they're coming back in or if they're people that just stepped in and stepped in right into the, you know, the 805s and the whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I mean, you would think that uh, <coughs> you would think that the growing breweries, just if you look at the data, um, you know, top 50 craft breweries, half of them are either flat or down right. over the last two years. So the breweries that are growing tend to be a little bit smaller in size, and those ones also tend to be, I don't know, maybe a little bit more on the sort of bleeding edge of trends right. and, and whatnot. So I am a little surprised to hear that those consumers actually prefer to be drinking a more mainstream or more approachable offering, a more session strength offering. It, it, yeah, it, it almost feels like, um, you know, there's Sierra Nevada presentation earlier today. They talked about how people, that, you know, one of their fears is that, oh, Sierra Nevada, you know, that's what my dad drank. Yeah. So kind of this whole thing of coming full circle, maybe people are coming in being like, well, I don't want to drink IPAs. That's what, you know, my uncle and my dad drink. So I'm going to drink something else. Interesting. Well, that could be the Gen Z consumer coming in and... Yeah. Maybe we'll see a lot of changes there. All right. Um, I think we are getting ready for Greg Cook to do his uh, tap talk coming up. Um, so I think that's all the time we have today. Right. Rob, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Our second time hanging out. I think the first time we hang out, we bumped into Archie Manning, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was a close personal friend. Yeah, close yeah. personal friend of ours now. <laughs> uh, we, we, he was drinking, now here's a little bit of market research. I think he was drinking a uh, Coors Light, was he? I believe he no, was. No, he was drinking a Bud Light because uh, I believe oh, they, have a, they have a Bud wholesaler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spaten owns a Bud wholesaler in Louisiana. So he was drinking a Bud Light. He's a company man, good for him. Uh, so there's your bit of consumer insight on Archie Manning. And if you want more great consumer insights, check out Data Quencher. And uh, enjoy Rob's work. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me.